the night that happened, I was on the phone to a colleague in Phoenix, Arizona, when it did happen, and although I didn't see it, I had a good second-hand description of it from uh, right, uh, right under the uh, flyover. Uh, a, a pretty, uh, an intense play-by-play, -play, I can imagine. So obviously that would lead us to our next question, which is, uh, the, if there is knowledge of this, and there's, you know, there's just an overwhelming amount of empirical data, and of course some aren't true, but you, you can't just simply whitewash the, the incredible you know, volume of, uh, of evidence around this around the world, then it would lead us to believe then that there is an effort to conceal or suppress the information for a, potentially a variety of reasons. Um, and, and so people, people speculate about disclosure. When, when would, if governments or certain cabals are aware of this, why A, would they be continuing to suppress the evidence, but B, is there a time where they might be ready to disclose this fact. Where do you stand on disclosure? Well, I'm hoping we're getting closer and closer to it. And I don't see any reason to really withhold it. Now, I suspect that the, uh, the prime reason has to do with power, control, and finance, and money. Uh, the people, the ones that seem to have control of not releasing the evidence, seem to be the ones that probably have the most knowledge of where it's, where it's going, how it has been, and perhaps already have some of the technology required. I do not know that for sure, but that would be my speculation. And there is a lot of speculation about that, and it does seem, again, from, a, from an outsider's perspective, that we've, we've advanced ridiculously at an exponential level technologically over the last, let's say, 100 years or so, Yet we haven't matured uh, from a sort of a, a sociological standpoint of how we treat each other, how we see each other. And those things, that growth seems to be inconsistent, which, again, for the people that speculate about whether we did extract knowledge, uh, technological knowledge that allowed for an increase in, in rocket propulsion and other things, that would maybe kind of make sense. I totally agree with what you're just saying. Absolutely. Well, uh, one of the things that's interesting, because you brought up zero point energy earlier and the more I understand about physics and from you know from a real layman's perspective without the academic background but but to hear you talk about that and to hear the people that are, are immersed in this field and, and to see the evidence of let's say uh, Nikola Tesla and what was being developed at the time it's it's hard to to not fully grasp that we probably are already there uh, in terms of having quote unquote free energy available to us and if if we understand from a physics standpoint that everything is made of energy and that we're that's accepted now that it, it seems almost insane that we would still be you know uh, creating energy producing energy from fossil fuels and other things where do you where do you stand on on what the development is or the knowledge level is around zero point energy and whether that is indeed being suppressed? Well, I, that's a possibility it's being suppressed. As far as I know, it, ha it has not been adequately developed uh, for us to be able to develop the new technologies out of it appropriately. We still, as far as I know, now I could be wrong, we still do not have even the ability to make a uh, manned spacecraft to go to Mars and back in a finite and a reasonable amount of time. We don't, we don't have that ability because it takes too much fuel. The Saturn, the type of vehicle we went to the moon in, uh, just is not adequate to do manned missions to Mars. And we've got to get past that. So it may be here. There, there are some in the business that say we can, we do have the knowledge to send the aliens back to their home planet. I do not know that personally to be true, but it could be. But if it is true, then we ought to get it out here and use it. Some of your uh, some of your peers uh, from uh, you know, various Apollo missions, and there's even uh, there's even transmissions back and forth between Mission Control and Apollo uh, uh, cap, uh, capsules, uh, where I, I remember one specifically where one of the astronauts is 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 telling Mission Control in Houston that they have quote unquote two bogeys on their tail. Other astronauts that have, have made the uh, made the same trek as you have talked about critters and other things. It seems as though 
that uh, even with you know even with that sort of uh, you know not gag order might be a strong word as far as NASA's concerned that a lot of the people that have have, have had the incredible privilege to uh, travel to the moon have had even in those missions experiences with UFOs. No, no, that does not seem to be the case. <clears throat> there are stories like that. Mm -hmm. I admit. There seem to have been some sightings in the shuttle missions yes. of no reliable. Since I was in mission control a goodly portion of the time during most of those missions, I know of, of no real uh, sighting and visitations in the, in the lunar voyages. And I would be glad to say so if I thought there were. And actually, those are, those are uh, and I apologize, because those were from uh, shuttle astronauts, not Apollo astronauts. Right, but, that's correct. Uh, as, as we, we'll take our last break, but when we come back with Dr. Mitchell, what I, you know, more than anything really want to hear you talk about is your vision for the future. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the term visionary is thrown around quite a bit, but from somebody that you know has had the incredible life experience that you've had and, and you talked about it earlier we are at a crossroads so there is no definitive picture of the future perhaps but there are at, let's say there are two and after the break we're going to talk to uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell about what he sees 10 years 20 years and 30 years down the line for the human race on uh, uh, right here on the one network we have to remember that right after world war 2 the army air force was separated and became the, Ar became the Air Force, a separate branch of service, and that the off OSS, which was the Office of Special Services, was disbanded and eventually became the CIA. So that here was a major military organization and a major intelligence organization, totally in disarray, new founded, didn't know what they were doing after World War II and not really reorganized yet. And as a result of that, the President Truman at that time um, convened a very high level uh, committee to examine this alien or UFO phenomenon. They did come to the conclusion that it was alien and the military uh, rightly came to the conclusion if, this, if they're hostile, there's nothing we can do about it. Therefore, their choice was to deny it and to hush it up and create a, the National Security Act of 1947, which validated that uh, uh, deception and covered it up and allowed the group to go underground, as it were. And we've been living with that now for 50 years. It is really the uh, beginning of the whole cover-up, the, the entire denial of this phenomenon. And we are back here on the One Network with uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, uh, the man that spent nine hours on the lunar surface, and a man that was transformed by his return trip to the Earth and what was uh, really an overwhelming metaphysical, spiritual ex uh, experience by being able to take in uh, the big blue marble, as they say, and, and, and really, you know, had a transformational effect on his, uh, on his personal and professional life going forward. He is the author of uh, The Way of the Explorer, and if you haven't read this book, I've had the pleasure. It's, it's again, there's very few people that are able to speak uh, to this particular subject matter from the level that somebody that's actually been in space and been to the moon. I, I really recommend that you pick it up. It's an absolutely fascinating read, and there's, uh, you know, there's plenty of excellent videos and documentaries, including In the Shadow of the Moon, The Living Matrix, that also include uh, the esteemed Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell, we talked about before the break, the future. And, um, you know, this is always speculation, obviously, because nobody knows for sure. And you mentioned earlier in the show that, you know, we are at a transformational period in human history. And, you know, really depending on, on our choices that we make, uh, whether we consciously evolve or whether we continue going down what is considered an unsustainable path right now. Give us Give us two, your two visions of the, of, of the future, uh, whether it be 10, 20, 30 years down the line, and, and, and where you think things are going to be going. Well, there's a, a new book from Arlington. Uh, We're losing you a bit, uh, again a bit, so... Uh, you said you're losing me? Yeah, that's better. Okay. Uh, I was trying to say that the Arlington book should just come on the edge. 
have released it. Actually, if you can just repeat that last part because we, we, we didn't uh, get you clearly there. Okay, we're sure. uh, The Arlington Institute, and uh, I was just outside of Washington, I just come out with a new book, On the Edge, uh, which gives us the next 10 to 20 years as being really the critical years to get our act together and to start to make a difference, or it's just going to be too late. And we will surely extinguish ourselves if we don't uh, get control of that. Now, one of the issues, of course, is weapons in space. We don't want to be, at one of my particular uh, interests, of course, is eliminating a warfare, learning to live together as a civilized population. We're spending too much of our money, time, and effort uh, killing at each other over whose God's the best God and border disputes and such nonsense. And if we're going to live as a civilization on this planet, we've got to learn to do it cooperatively, cooperatively and go into space cooperatively. I say in my lectures quite frequently that we will get on to Mars in due course. But when we go to Mars and look back at this tiny little planet we call Earth, it will look just like a little speck in the sky. It'll sound kind of silly to say I came from the United States or Britain or Canada or Germany or Israel or wherever. No, it came from Earth. And we're not really ready to do that yet. We've got to get our act together and do this as a civilization because we're still spending too much time doing all the hostile things that, that the competitors do to each other as opposed to working together. Do you believe, that, as even Ronald Reagan once stated, uh, that it might take something from outside uh, for, for us to be, again, aware of civilization uh, of, of species or beings outside of the earth for us to come together instead of, as you said, black or white, American or Canadian or Muslim or Christian, and then start to really have almost a, a rewiring of how we see each other our, as, our, as ourselves as human first and then all of those things second. Well, I think we'd have to do that, absolutely. And let's hope that our ET visitors and I Everything I said, they are encouraging us. They are uh, tending to be friendly toward us. If they weren't, and they could have undone us a long time ago, but uh, I think if we take that approach and we're trying to make things work and survive and get our system, our civilization back on course again, we can do that. And, and, and you've mentioned, uh, you know, before that you've talked to people, some deceased now, that have essentially, you know, shared with you that, of course, you know, inside of, you know, the, the halls of power, this, this knowledge exists. Uh, I know that those people have, have passed on, but, uh, you, you know, as somebody that's an insider, you have had conversations that have made you pretty convinced that uh, this, this knowledge exists. 